Hostile? I show you hostile. So funny story, that actually happened to me in court and I also punched the witness. Hey Legal Eagles, D. James Stone here teaching you how to think like a lawyer so you can crush law school. You know, growing up, I loved watching legal movies. There's nothing better than seeing great lawyers stick it to evil corporations or obstreperous witnesses. It's one of the reasons that I went to law school and became a trial lawyer myself. And now that I've been an attorney at a major law firm for over 10 years, I thought I'd take some time and review some of the most famous legal scenes from movie history. So let's dive right in. The first scene comes from one of the most famous courtroom scenes of all time in A Few Good Men. Defense will be calling Airman Cecil O'Malley and Airman Anthony Rodriguez. They were working to ground crew at Andrews at 2 a.m. on the 7th. Your Honor, these men weren't on the list. Rebuttal witnesses, Your Honor, are called specifically to refute testimony offered under direct examination. Uh, so this is actually fairly accurate. Um, one of the things that people don't know about trial is that there, there's so much you have to do before you go into the courtroom. It takes weeks and sometimes months to prepare your pretrial filings. And one of the things that you have to do is you have to tell the other side uh, what evidence you're going to present and what witnesses you're going to call. Uh, and what Kevin Bacon is doing here is he's saying that these witnesses were not on the disclosures from the defense and therefore they shouldn't be allowed. And uh, in normal circumstances, that would be the case. If they weren't disclosed, then the judge would be correct in disallowing those witnesses. However, there's an exception to this, which is where you are calling witnesses that are specifically to rebut the evidence that was presented by the other side. You effectively didn't know that you had to call these witnesses and they're only there to rebut the evidence. So this is actually a, a part of trial law that you don't really see in movies very much, hearkening back to all those pretrial filings. So this is actually fairly accurate. I'll allow the witnesses. This is ridiculous. Colonel, a moment ago, check the tower logs for Christ's sake. Uh, I would not expect a witness to opine from the stand like that. Uh, they usually are only allowed to speak when a question is presented to them. Uh, and uh, Tom Cruise would have been within his rights to object and to move to strike the statement as non-responsive. Well, we'll get to the airman in just a minute, sir. A moment ago, you said that you ordered Lieutenant Kendrick to tell his men that Santiago wasn't to be touched. That's right. And Lieutenant Kendrick was clear on what you wanted? Crystal. Uh, so, hard for a witness to know what another person was thinking. Um, he's opining about the mental state of another person. Uh, that's probably speculation and probably wouldn't be allowed in, in most courts. Any chance Lieutenant Kendrick ignored the order? Ignored the order? Any chance he forgot about it? No. Any chance Lieutenant Kendrick left your office and said, the old man is wrong? No. When Lieutenant Kendrick spoke to- At this point, there's no foundation being laid as to how the colonel would know any of this information. Uh, it's possible that he would, but you're not allowed to just go up there and ask someone to talk about things that other people did without laying the proper foundation that, um, that they have the personal knowledge to know what actually happened. You can't just say, I gave an order and I know everyone is always going to, to follow that order. Although I think that that's sort of the point, the trap that, uh, that Tom Cruise is laying here. When Lieutenant Kendrick spoke to the platoon and ordered them not to touch Santiago, any chance they ignored him? You ever served in an infantry unit, son? No, sir. So generally, witnesses are not allowed to ask questions of the attorney when they're on the witness stand. The attorney is the only one that's allowed to ask the questions here, and Tom Cruise would be well within his rights to ask the judge to instruct the witness to answer the question. He's being non-responsive, but at the same time, He's employing a, a tried and true strategy of giving the witness uh, rope so that they can hang themselves. Uh, here we know that, uh, that Jack Nicholson is, is going to make some crucial admissions in just a second. And by giving him the freedom to uh, do these things that you wouldn't normally do on the witness stand, uh, he's falling into the trap that, that Tom Cruise has laid here. Yes, sir. Are we clear? Are we clear? Crystal. Crystal. 
Colonel, I have just one more question before I call Airman O'Malley and Airman Rodriguez. If you gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, and your orders are always followed, then why would Santiago be in danger? So technically this is an argumentative question. The uh, argument is uh, integral to the question itself. It's one of those questions that's like, uh, you know, when did you stop beating your wife? Well, that implies the argument that you were in fact beating your wife. So here it's the same sort of thing where uh, he's he's laid this trap and, and created an argument through the question itself that Jack Nicholson can't really answer the question without falling into the argument that's being made. So it's not technically a proper question, but by the same token, he's simply using the witness's words against them. And uh, it's uh, some nice legal trickery. Why would it be necessary? to transfer him off the base. Santiago was a substandard Marine. He was being transferred. That's not what you said. You said he was being transferred because he was in grave danger. That's correct. You right. said he was in danger. I said grave danger. You said, is there I any recall other... what I said. I can have the court reporter read back to you. I know what I said. I don't have to have it read back to me like I'm... Why the two orders? Uh, so a couple things going on here. Number one, you're not allowed to interrupt the witness, and nor is the witness generally allowed to interrupt the attorney. Uh, that that is sort of the definition of badgering the witness, and uh, it's also muddying up the record as well. Uh, Tom Cruise uh, alludes to the stenographer who is typing away every word that's being said, and that's generally standard practice in almost any trial. Um, and the attorneys are allowed to read back portions of the record to the witness to, to get their uh, clarifying statement. Um, however, the judge is not going to allow the attorney and the witness to talk over each other because it's impossible for the stenographer to record two voices at the same time, and that simply muddies the record, which uh, is the last thing you want because you have to have a pristine record in order to take uh, an appeal uh, from the trial. Colonel? Sometimes men take matters into their own hands. No, sir, you made it clear just a moment ago that your men never take matters in their own hands. Your men follow orders or people die. So Santiago shouldn't have been in any danger at all, should he have, Colonel? That's more you argument. You snotty little bastard. Your Honor, I'd like to ask for a recess. I'd like an answer to the question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendrick... Which is funny because he asks for an answer to the question he just asked, uh, and then proceeds to immediately ask another question. If, if you have a good question and you need an answer to it, you are allowed to petition the judge to, uh, to instruct the witness to answer, but um, you shouldn't then immediately ask another question. Lawyers actually do this all the time. They forget the sequencing of the questions. This happens both in court and in depositions, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not a good way to lay a, a proper record. Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! And when it went bad, you cut constant. these guys loose! Your Honor! You had markets inside a bony transfer! Your Honor! You doctored the logbook! Damn it, Captain! You coerced the doctor! Consider not yourself in contempt! You. Colonel Jeff! So, uh, you are not allowed to yell in court. Uh, that is uh, completely improper. Also, it ruins your image in front of the jury. Credibility is everything in front of the jury. And if you are this hothead who's yelling in court, you're going to ruin your rapport with the jury. Um, and so you're not going to see a lot of yelling in court uh, in the way that Tom Cruise and, and Kevin Bacon are doing here. Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's going to do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know, that Santiago's death, while tragic, probably saved lives, and my existence while... So, it's, it's a great line, and uh, man, it makes for, for a good movie, but uh, you're never going to see these kind of Perry Mason moments in court. By the time you get to court, you've been preparing for weeks. Your attorney has gone over every conceivable question that you're going to be asked, um, and they were, are going to help you uh, craft the testimony itself. And uh, so the trials are won and lost on the evidence and the documents. Um, they are not won and lost on uh, assuming that the witness is going to go nuts on the stand and go into a shouting match where they basically admit guilt. Uh, that's not going to happen. 
I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. Did you order the code red? I did the job. Did you order the code red? You're goddamn right I did. I have never once seen a witness admit to uh, the crime <laughs> or the uh, civil act that they are accused of on the witness stand. Um, just doesn't happen. Somehow, witnesses know that their their ass is on the line and uh, they're not willing to uh, admit to something that's against their interest. It just doesn't happen very often. The next scene comes from the classic legal movie, 12 Angry Men. What actually happened is this. The boy stayed home, had another fight with his father, stabbed him to death, and left the house at 10 minutes after 12. He even remembered to wipe the knife clean of fingerprints. Now, are you trying to tell me that this knife really fell through a hole in the boy's pocket, someone picked it up off the street, went to the boy's house, and stabbed his father with it just to test its sharpness? No, I'm just saying it's possible the boy lost his knife and that somebody else stabbed his father with a similar knife. It's just possible. This is a really interesting conversation amongst uh, jurors in the jury room after the trial has concluded. Um, a, a criminal trial has a very, very high burden of proof. Uh, you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And you'll never get any, any judge to tell you what mathematically that's supposed to be. But a lawyer's shorthand would be that beyond a reasonable doubt uh, has to be between 95 and 99% uh, sure, before you're allowed to convict someone. Uh, as opposed to the civil arena, which is where I have practiced, uh, where you only have to be 51% sure. You have to be, you have to show your case is true more likely than not. So that's essentially 51% uh, proven. Um, but a, a, a criminal trial has a much higher burden of proof. So this jury is debating uh, uh, this very high level is a coincidence enough to show reasonable doubt? Um, and that's an open question, and it's the question that they should be debating. Take a look at this knife. It's a very unusual knife. I've never seen one like it. Neither had the storekeeper who sold it to the boy. Aren't you asking us to accept a pretty incredible coincidence? I'm just saying a coincidence is possible. And I say it's not possible. Where did you get it? I went out walking for a couple of hours last night. I walked through the boy's neighborhood. I bought that in a little pawn shop just two blocks from the boy's house. It cost six dollars. So um, the jury is doing the right thing by debating whether the prosecution has proved their case by a reasonable doubt. However, a jury is not allowed to bring in additional evidence outside of what was presented to them by the prosecution and told to them by the judge. That's completely improper. Uh, this jury would probably be uh, disbanded and uh, a mistrial declared uh, for this kind, of, um, this kind of act that goes beyond what a, a jury is allowed to do. It's against the law to buy or sell switchblade knives. That's right, I broke the law. Listen, you pulled a real bright trick. Now, supposing you tell me what it proves. However, the defendant in this case uh, would have been well served if his lawyers had done what Peter Fonda does here and actually gone out to see where someone could buy this really unusual knife because it stands to reason that um, if it is a completely unique knife, then that is very probative of, of the idea that he committed this murder. However, if it's a very common knife, uh, you know, these jurors don't know whether it's common or not, so they should have been presented with evidence in the trial as to whether the knife is common or not. But they should not have brought the knife into the jury room. Maybe there are ten knives like that, so what? Maybe there are. Well, what does it mean? You found another knife like it. What's that, the discovery of the age or something? You mean you're asking us to believe that somebody else did the stabbing with exactly the same kind of knife? The odds are a million to one. It's possible, but not very probable. That is a classic distinction in criminal law between something that is uh, impossible or probable or coincidental. You'll often hear on TV and movies that the evidence is circumstantial. Well, the evidence is almost always circumstantial. That's not uh, a criticism of the evidence, and it doesn't mean that circumstantial evidence can't be incredibly strong. The circumstantial evidence here is probably pretty strong. It's unlikely that another murderer used a similar or exactly the same knife. 
um, direct evidence is the opposite of circumstantial evidence, which would be someone actually watching the uh, event taking place, for example. Um, circumstantial evidence can be very strong. Uh, just because someone says the evidence is circumstantial doesn't mean that it's not, uh, it's not good evidence. And uh, that's what the jury is debating here. You know, it's interesting that he'd find a knife exactly like the one the boy bought. What's interesting about it? Interesting. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. There are still 11 of us here who think he's guilty. Right. What do you think you're going to accomplish? You're not going to change anybody's mind. So if you want to be stubborn and hang this jury, go ahead. The kid will be tried again and found guilty as sure as he's born. Probably right. Okay, the next video comes from the classic legal movie and Justice for All. And ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution is not going to get that man today. No. Because I'm going to get him. My client, the Honorable Henry T. Fleming, should go right to fucking jail! The son of a bitch is guilty! Okay, so uh, Al Pacino has had it with the system. He's the defense lawyer for uh, this, uh, this uh, defendant. And he has had it with <laughs> the defendant. And he says, my client is guilty. A couple problems with this. Uh, lawyers uh, have a duty to their client. Um, every state has uh, rules of professional conduct for the attorneys, and every defendant is entitled to a zealous advocate. Uh, Al Pacino has uh, basically given away all of his duties to his client and basically conceded on his client's behalf of the client's guilt. Now, uh, that uh, may present some big problems for uh, Al Pacino later on down the line, um, he's probably going to get disbarred. Um, you are not allowed to take action that is contrary to the um, benefit of your client. Um, and uh, if he had problems with his client, the, the, the proper remedy would be to ask the court to uh, remove him from the case and uh, to give his client time to find uh, other representation. Uh, it is not proper to admit to the jury that your client is guilty, um, he will, uh, he'll, he'll likely get disbarred for that action. So here, uh, Al Pacino has uh, violated many of the rules of professional conduct, and he's likely to be disbarred pretty quickly after this outburst in court. He's guilty! That man Mr. is Kirkland. guilty! That man there! That Kirkland. man is a slime! He is a slime! If he's allowed to go free, then something really wrong is going on. Mr. Kirkland, you are out of order. You're out of order. You're out of order. The whole trial is out of order. They're out of order. Yeah, so uh, if, you, um, uh, if you start yelling at the judge like this uh, and you violate the judge's instructions, which Al Pacino is doing, um, you're very likely to be held in contempt of court. The judge has uh, enormous leeway to uh, keep the order uh, in his courtroom. Uh, and one of the ways that he can do that is by sending attorneys to jail. Um, so it's pretty rare, uh, but this is an instance where, uh, uh, where really contempt is probably in order. Al Pacino may go to jail here. Um, and frankly, this outburst is so prejudicial to the client that, uh, frankly, I, I think the judge would probably uh, declare a mistrial, which means that he would disband the jury and they would start the trial all over again with a different jury pool. That man, that sick, all right, crazy, depraved man, raped and beat that woman there, and he'd like to do it again. He told me so. It's just a show. Yep, yeah, there yes, are the bailiffs like taking yes, Al Pacino like away. Okay, the next scene comes from The Dark Knight. Sorry I'm late, folks. Where were you? Where you'd have to step up. Harvey, I know these briefs backwards. Well, the fair's fair. Heads, I'll take it. 
Tailsy's all yours. Oh, yeah? You want to flip a coin to see who leads? It's my father's lucky coin. As I recall, it got me my first date with you. I wouldn't leave something like that up to chance. I don't. I make my own luck. All rise. The Honorable Judge Freedom presiding. So there uh, often is some contention about who's going to handle uh, cases. Um, in a high-profile case like this, almost always the uh, a senior attorney uh, would would handle it, and uh, so it's unlikely that a junior uh, prosecutor or district attorney would get to handle such a high-profile case in this case. However, if um, if the DA didn't show up, then the the junior deputy uh, would probably have to handle. I thought the DA just played golf with the mayor, things like that. The offs one thirty, more than enough time to put you away for life, Sally. Sometimes the head DA is not the best person to try a case. Sometimes they're just a political head who uh, run the department rather than actually conduct the trials. Markham, someone must have stepped up to run the so-called family. Is that man in this courtroom today? Could you identify him for us, please? You win, counselor. It was me. <laughs> I have a sworn statement from you that this man, Salvatore Moroni, is the new head of the Falcone crime family. Moroni? In the criminal world, uh, there aren't depositions beforehand. Uh, however, the police may take a statement or the DA may take a statement from a witness, uh, and you can use that statement to impeach uh, the testimony of the witness on the stand. In the civil world, there are very likely to be depositions, which means that you will ask questions and answers, and if the witness deviates from what was in their deposition, then you are allowed to bring that up to uh, the trier of fact and show that they cannot be trusted, that they break their word. Um, and that's sort of what is going on with the statement that I have a sworn statement. I mean, you're not allowed to literally just hold up a sworn statement. You are allowed to enter it into evidence and to question the witness about it, but, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're taking some liberties here. Moroni? He's a fall guy. I'm the brains of the organization. <laughs> Order. Permission to treat the witness as hostile. Granted. Hostile? I see you hostile! <laughs> so, funny story, that actually happened to me in court, and I also punched the witness. I'm kidding. The next scene comes from Aaron Brockovich. Let's be honest here. Twenty million dollars is more money than these people have ever dreamed of. Oh, see, now that pisses me off. First of all, since the demur, we have more than 400 plaintiffs in. Let's be honest. We all know there are more out there. Uh, so that's uh, interesting legal jargon. It's actually fairly accurate. This seems like uh, a settlement discussion. Uh, between the defense and the prosecution. And uh, what Julie Roberts has said there is that after the demur, they've gotten more plaintiffs, which uh, a demur is like a motion to dismiss. The defendants tried to dismiss the case out of hand, um, but they obviously lost. And since that time, uh, the, the uh, defense side has found uh, even more plaintiffs. This is a class action lawsuit. So the more plaintiffs and the more injured parties potentially uh, the, the more recovery uh, may be on the table. But by the same token, um, the more members of a class, uh, the, uh, the less money every individual plaintiff is going to get. If you have to take the pie and spread it up into uh, more payments, then they're not likely to get nearly as much. So $20 million may sound like a lot, but if it's spread out amongst hundreds or thousands of people, which is what Julia Roberts is saying is happening, they may not get very much personally into their own pockets. They may not be the most sophisticated people, but they do know how to divide, and $20 million isn't shit when you split it between them. Aaron. Second of all, these people don't dream about being rich. They dream about being able to watch their kids swim in a pool without worrying that they'll have to have a hysterectomy at the age of 20, like Rosa Diaz, a client of ours, or have their spine deteriorate like Stan Bloom, another client of ours. So before you come back here with another lame-ass offer, I want you to think real hard about what your spine is worth, Mr. Walker. Or what you might expect someone to pay you for your uterus, Miss Sanchez. Then you take out your calculator and you multiply that number by a hundred. Anything less than that is a waste of our time. 
So she is hinting at uh, one of the crucial uh, elements of a uh, civil lawsuit, which is that it is supposed to uh, provide compensation for injury that you actually incurred. And uh, in this particular case, there was, uh, it's, it's actually based on a real case uh, in California where a community's water was poisoned. And as a result, they had very high incidences of cancer and other uh, deleterious ailments. Um, and so if you tried every individual one of these cases, each individual might get you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars from uh, a party if they were responsible for it. But because it's a class action, they're all lumped together. And Julie Roberts is saying, basically, you need to compensate every single one of these people for the injuries that they incurred um, and not just provide what seems like a large number uh, in the aggregate when you have to spread it out amongst a lot of different people. So it's a good negotiating tactic. It's a good way to anchor uh, your, uh, your position. Um, and it's pretty common amongst class actions. By the way, we had that water brought in special for you folks. It came from Well and Hinkley. That's hilarious. <clears throat> I think this meeting is over. Damn right it is. So that's a fairly accurate depiction of what happens when you have two sides um, negotiating amongst each other. Uh, when you have just the parties themselves, it gets uh, heated very often. Um, and that's why it's, it's so common to have a neutral third party, a, a mediator come in and mediate the two sides. Um, I've used a mediator many times. It really helps advance the ball. The mediator can't force anyone to do anything, um, but they can provide um, some external validation and they can uh, move things along. It's, uh, it's really money well spent um, to make sure that you don't reach an impasse in a negotiation like what happens here. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Ed, Aaron, what's this? May I? Yep, go ahead. Well, you know what, Mr. Potter, we completely forgot your birthday this year, and seeing as how you've been so good to me, it seemed a terrible oversight. So what Ed and I have been doing the last few days is putting together a present for you. 634. They're all signed. Every single one. Holy shit. Now don't go getting jealous, Teresa. Jealous. We have something for you too. This is actually a really interesting part of the law that you almost never see uh, in movies and television. Uh, Aaron Brockovich involves uh, a class action lawsuit, one that actually took place. And uh, part of a class action lawsuit is, is the idea that you have a, a, a small subsection of the total number of people that were harmed called representatives, and they represent a class of people uh, that have been harmed. And so you say that these people are representative of the entire class and therefore uh, whatever compensation the representatives get should be given to the entire class. And what Erin Brockovich has done is she's gone out and she's gotten declarations from 600 people saying that they were harmed. And so effectively they have 600 people representing the class. And that's important because defense attorneys try to uh, defeat a class by showing that class representatives uh, don't represent the class, or their claims are unusual, uh, or there are a whole number of reasons uh, why uh, you would defeat a class action by um, disqualifying one or two class members. And often, class actions only have a single class member, or maybe two or three. So Aaron Brockovich has gone out, and she's gotten six over, over 600 people to say that they want to be members of the class, which really strengthens uh, the class action lawsuit that they're trying to bring. So you don't hear about that part of class actions very often, but that is pretty accurate to what uh, plaintiff's attorneys uh, try and do in the class action context. How did you do this? Well, um, seeing as how I have no brains or legal expertise, and Ed here was losing all faith in the system, am I right? Oh yeah, completely no faith, no faith. I just went up there and performed sexual favors. 634 blowjobs in five days. I'm really quite tired. 
<laughs> so those are some of my favorite legal movies. Uh, some are more realistic than others, but it's always fun to see how Hollywood thinks lawyers react in real life. If you'd like to see more Lawyer Reacts videos or hear about my law school experience or more uh, legal war stories, please click on this short playlist that I put together. It includes the latest video I did on law school horror stories. I think you'll really like it. Uh, please click subscribe if you like this video so that you never miss the next one. And otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.